Hello, I'm Graham McTavish, and I've come here to rural Warwickshire in the heart of England to explore the background to one of the most famous works of literature in the world, The Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien's great work has its roots firmly steeped in this landscape. This is where Tolkien grew up, and it is these fields and farms which form the inspiration of the Shire from which the whole adventure begins. Tolkien consciously felt himself deeply rooted in the village life of the Midlands where he spent the early part of his childhood. He was very open-eyed about it and in his portraits of various hobbits you can see different aspects of the English character as he felt it existed in that English setting. Uh, on the one hand, plucky, down-to-earth, courageous when pushed to it. On the other hand, parochial, country bumpkinish, uh, and very set in its ways. And he has great pleasure, I think, in both The Hobbit and in The Lord of the Rings, in playing with both sides of that coin. One couldn't really engage him in conversation. You couldn't make him follow your conversational leads at all. It was merely that some chance remark might strike him off. I remember, um, for some reason, mentioning the Marx Brothers and being astonished that he was prepared to talk at some length about them. I don't know that he'd actually had seen their films, but he obviously thought he had. Yes, well, he was uh, a really absent-minded professor, and uh, at the post office in High Street, the old lady there was rather a dragon, but he won her over by posting his false teeth through the screen and putting his envelope in his mouth. Similarly, the bank uh, used to keep all the things he left there. I once went with him to the bank, and they opened the drawer and gave him back his last two or three pipes and gloves and things. He was essentially a Victorian, and Victorians uh, had skills in the arts, of uh, either of mu in doing amateur music or in doing amateur art. I had a grandmother who was uh, an, a watercolorist, she wasn't a great watercolorist, but she did it as a, a lady's occupation. And in a sense, Tolkien had picked up this Victorian habit of uh, practicing an art. And he practiced watercolor and pastels very effectively. By the time the tale has reached the second book of the trilogy, The Two Towers, the peace and tranquility you see around here has been left behind in a journey which is fast descending into nightmare. The Two Towers opens in the aftermath of the ferocious fight between Boromir and the Orcs. Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli come upon the dying Boromir. With his last words, Boromir confesses that he tried to take the ring from Frodo, hoping to use it for the defense of Minas Tirith. He tells Aragorn that the Orcs have captured the two hobbits, Merry and Pippin. Although, you know, he's done a lot of wrong, you know, at the end, um, he dies repentant and confessing, even. The Orc Trail leads Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli on a desperate pursuit on foot, north and west across the fields of Rohan, a punishing journey of over 165 miles. After two days of the weary chase, with little hope of gaining on their quarry, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli encounter a party of horse warriors returning from a successful battle against the Orc band. Their leader is Eomer, nephew to King Theoden of Rohan. His people are the Roarim. The Roarim, or the Riders of Rohan, are a warrior society. Tolkien patterns the speech and society of the Roarim on those of the Anglo-Saxons, whose literature formed one of his academic specialities. In the hangings on the wall in, you know, um, in Meduseld, Theoden's Hall, you know, the, it's all very much. You know, and they're even quoting old English poetry, where well, now is the horse and the rider, you know, which is an, um, Tolkien adapting an old English verse, you know. And so, yeah, they're old English. By placing the apparent archaism of Rurim culture against the far greater antiquity of Gondor and Numenor, Tolkien creates a very effective sense of the vast stretches of past time that lie behind the narrative of The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien felt he'd written The Lord of the Rings as a freestanding book that readers ought to be able to appreciate on its own. He certainly did not expect all of his readers to share his fascination with languages, 
or with their historical settings and with their histories as languages. That said, it's clear to most enthusiastic readers of Tolkien's work that the history of Middle-earth, stretching back to its very creation and its first age, is a, a crucial backdrop to what's going on in The Lord of the Rings, where Sauron comes from, where the ring comes from, where characters, other characters such as Elrond and Galadriel come from, uh, remains a matter of dim and distant history by the time you're in the Third Age. Now, Tolkien often claimed that that was a specific effect that he was looking for. He wanted to write the story with just a vague sense of historical immensity stretching out behind them. And that to achieve that effect, it was rather like doing a painted backdrop in the theater scene. You didn't need actually miles of landscape in your theater. You only needed a reasonable representation of those on a backdrop to achieve the effect. That said, he was an obsessive enough scenery painter, if you like, that he brought far more detail to it than was absolutely necessary. Tolkien's scholarly accomplishments as a critic of medieval English literature was grounded in his training in philology, the linguistic science that looks particularly at how languages change and evolve over time. His deep study of the history of European languages inspired him to try his hand at creating a language of his own. And having created a language, Tolkien felt compelled to give a cultural and historical setting to that language. And it was in this way that he began to write a series of legends that eventually formed the basis of the Silmarillion. The stories continue to grow, to expand. Tolkien often used the metaphor of a tree spreading its branches, sinking down roots, constantly expanding, exfoliating, branching. It was one of the reasons he was never able to finish it was that it kept splitting off new narrative strands and expanding in his, in his mind. And he was either unable or, I suspect, unwilling to prune it down to something more manageable that could produce a single book. I have a feeling if he'd had another 50 years, he probably would never have got to the end of it either, and his son would still have been editing it. The languages of Middle-earth form the seed out of which came all of the stories that Tolkien wrote. Now, although Tolkien uses language fairly sparingly in The Lord of the Rings, the ones that do appear add depth and colour to the whole world of Middle-earth. The vast majority of the peoples of Middle-earth at the time in which The Lord of the Rings is set use the common tongue, or Westron, as a universal lingua franca. It is the language represented by modern English in Tolkien's text. The Roarim speak an extremely archaic form of the common tongue, untouched by the elvish influences that entered the language of Numenor. As a result, their language bears the same relationship to the common tongue that Old English bears to Modern English. So Tolkien represents their language as Old English. Theoden is an Old English word meaning ruler. Medjuseld, an Old English word meaning mead hall. Eoma and Eowyn are Old English personal names. And Theoden's word for hobbits, Holbitla, is a made-up Old English compound which means whole builder. And had it existed in Old English and survived into Modern English, it would have taken a form very like Hobbit. The resourcefulness shown by Merry and Pippin during their captivity among Saruman's orcs is the direct result of their plucky resistance to the despair their plight could be expected to induce in them. Merry and Pippin are raced north and west by their orc captors for two and a half days across the east emnet of Rohan, to the edge of the forest of Fangorn. The forest of Fangorn extends east from the southern ranges of the Misty Mountains. The river Entwash emerges from its southern edge 
to empty itself to the south and east into the Anduin, while the river Limlite flows east from the mountains through the forest's northern reaches. Along with the forest of Mirkwood, Lothlorien, and the old forest between the Shire and Rivendell, Fangorn is a remnant of a much larger forest that once covered Middle-earth from the Blue Mountains in the west to the Iron Hills in the east. Throughout his work, uh, Tolkien represents forests as places of renewed hope. Um, anyone familiar with Tolkien's biography will be aware of the great regard he had for trees. Uh, his letters are peppered with angry denunciations against tree felling to clear way for modern life. He quite rightly associated another of his great hates, which is modernity, with the destruction of nature and trees in particular. So it's not surprising then that trees and forests play a special role in his work. The trees, you know, they're not there just for timber. Trees have an existence in themselves. Don't ask what purpose is a tree. You know, what's a tree for? A tree is a tree. The forests are clearly sentient and to the point where, of course, some of them are able to move around, not only the Ents, but in Fangorn as well. The trees move around unaccountably. And there are strong individual trees in The Lord of the Rings that have their own, that are their own characters. Though nominally allied with Sauron, Saruman's own desire to possess the ring causes him to direct his orcs to bring the captive hobbits to Isengard rather than directly to Mordor. And the quarrels that arise between the orcs of Isengard and those of Mordor during their forced march towards Fangorn offers Merry and Pippin the chance to escape. When Tolkien was writing this, he didn't know what was going to happen. At the end, And he's got this idea that they should have an encounter with giant, a giant, you know, probably an unfriendly one. And Ent, of course, is an old English word meaning giant. Calling themselves the shepherds of trees, the Ents have tended the dwindling forests of Middle-earth since its earliest ages. Of the language of the Ents, Tolkien gives no direct examples in his text. The few strange words and phrases used by Treebeard are actually a series of elvish words strung together and fashion. When Treebeard playfully objects to the word hill as the name of such a topographical feature, he notes that the Entish word for the same thing will be a record of its entire history, a linguistic embodiment of the thing itself rather than a generalization. How such a language might actually work, Tolkien leaves to our imaginations. At the time of the events narrated in The Lord of the Rings, the Ents have suffered a long, slow, and irrevocable decline. The Ents and their Ent wives have become estranged. The Ents are not immortal, so their numbers have steadily dwindled with no hope of increase. Treebeard predicts that their action against Saruman could in fact prove their last. Treebeard's forest of Fangorn has been suffering particularly grievous injuries at the hands of Saruman's orcs. With Merry and Pippin on his shoulders, Treebeard leads the Ents on a great march to Isengard. The single-minded obsession of Sauron and Saruman with extending their power leaves them fatally vulnerable to threats that approach them from unexpected quarters. Saruman's impatience with the slow processes of nature lead him to overlook the fury that overtakes him out of Fangorn. Trees, of course, can't fight back in real life, but in the fictional world of Middle-earth, Tolkien can give them a power of their own. So when the Ents attack Isengard, he, he memorably describes their demolition of its walls as being like um, the action of tree roots over the centuries, but accelerated into a few moments. It's a very powerful image, and, and Tolkien is clearly on the side of the trees and against the forces of modernization. Uh, since Saruman has turned the open green spaces of Isengard into an industrial age wasteland, the scene can be seen as a, a bit of a rebuke directed at all of those that change and clear away the natural world. This is really nature getting its own back on civilization in a sense, 
on certainly on urban civilization and certainly on you know the sort of flash postmodern buildings with glass elevators and so on here the southernmost peaks of the misty mountains divide to form a valley known as nan kuranir the wizard's vale this is where the men of gondor built the fortress of isengard originally it was a grassy park surrounded by a great wall with a single gate to the south in it was the tower of orthanc a lofty structure comprising four massive piers of stone that meet to form most of its length and then separate into four sharp teeth at the summit. Its name in Elvish means Mount Fang. Saruman populated it with orcs, wolves and wild men who were to serve his own ambitions. There are a number of different races in the two towers, but the orc are the most noticeable. Squat, ugly and bestial. Orcs are filled with a deeply ingrained hostility towards all living things, including their own kind and their masters. And they have formed the largest portion of any army mustered by the forces of evil throughout the history of Middle-earth. Other peoples have, have the choice. You know, they are moral beings. Orcs aren't. Orcs are just nasty autonomata. You know, they're nasty. You know, what is an orc? It is nasty. You know, um, you, you don't get orcs pondering, you know, should I do something nice today, you know, um, for breakfast. Uh, the, the, the few virtues that they've got are the sort of very basic military virtues of teamwork. Um, but even then, you know, they're always betraying each other. They always represented something of a theological problem for Tolkien because uh, he felt obliged to, as it were, believe that uh, um, all things ultimately come from God. So anything evil or bad in the world is merely a, a corruption of something that was originally good. At the same time, uh, when the orcs actually are talking, I mean, when we actually, as it were, meet orcs, um, in the in the story, um, they're not. Uh, they don't sound completely alien or foreign. They're not like the Black Riders. They are recognizable in some way. And I know lots of readers who have this sort of perverse affection for for the orcs. Actually, and, um, for example, might admire their independence of spirit. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, they're um, they too are a bit more complicated than they might appear at first. Orcs first appear in the Fellowship of the Ring, but it is in the two towers that we really gain an insight into this hideous race. In Tolkien's mythology, orcs were created and bred first by Morgoth and subsequently by his lieutenant, Sauron, in a brutal parody of the elves' grace and beauty. The orcs speak a bastardized version of the common speech, laced with elements of the black tongue, the language of Mordor devised by Sauron. Here, Tolkien uses more impressionistic detail, creating a language full of dark back vowels, U, O, and heavily stocked consonants, K, G, T, to create a tongue whose few examples sound both alien and unlovely to English ears. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli searched the site of the orcs' last stand with little hope of finding the hobbits alive until they discover hobbit footprints leading into the forest of Fangor. They follow these, but are stopped before long by a wandering old man in a tattered grey cloak. Suspecting at first that he is Saruman the White, they raise their weapons, but he throws off his cloak and they recognise Gandalf. The wizard has returned. Gandalf is much the same as the, at the end as he was the beginning, only more powerful and Gandalf the White. It's, he's gone up, you know, he's been promoted, as it were. Given the fact that he represents an order of being far higher than that of any other character in The Lord of the Rings, it is remarkable that Gandalf should display any recognizable character at all. Still more that we should see it develop in any way. Although he has supernatural provenance and power, Gandalf is in many ways the most fully human of all Tolkien's characters. By turns, he is grave, playful, irascible, and enigmatic. 
His responses to other characters and to events run through a wide range of human moods and emotions. He can be tenderly solicitous of humble characters like the hobbits, or show the irritation of a grumpy grandfather. He can speak on equal terms with elf lords such as Elrond or Glorfindel, or chastise at need kings and stewards such as Theoden of Rohan or Denethor of Gondor. He can take unaffected delight in the most trivial matters of Shire gossip, while remaining a formidable master of arcane wisdom. His mere presence lends hope to characters otherwise falling into despair, and the true measure of his mastery of his formidable powers is how sparingly he uses them. He's the most powerful, probably the most single powerful individual on the, um, on the good side, so to speak, in The Lord of the Rings. But he makes it very clear, and, and through him Tolkien makes it very clear, that Sauron is stronger still. And it's significant that although he's very powerful magically and in, and in other ways, he can't use force directly to fight uh, Mordor. Somehow, to the extent that you go too far in that direction, you become what you're fighting. The great change he undergoes during the course of The Lord of the Rings is, of course, his death in the mines of Moria, followed by his return to Middle-earth. On the one hand, such a transformation marks him out as a being far beyond the human experience. Yet the keynote of his character after his return is amplification rather than change as such. Gandalf says, I was sent back. Doesn't say who, by, uh, or where he was, but he was sent back. The Lord of the Rings is not a religious book in that it's not about God and the angels and so on, but in fact it's a very religious book in tone, and he knew this while writing it. It's really, um, it's, it's a book which tries to convey the feeling of religion to a world which is not actually a believing world, and a non-religious world. This, I think, is largely why it's been so popular in America, in what is on the whole a, 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 a kind of godless modern world. Um, it particularly appeals because it's, 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 bringing, uh, it's bringing religion back into fiction. In the world of Middle-earth, the month of February has 30 days. After their meeting with Gandalf on February the 30th, they turn south across the west emnet of Rohan to reach Edoras, the principal seat of Theoden in his kingdom, on March the 1st. number of scenes in the two towers that dramatise a, a universal sense of melancholy. There's an awareness of the inevitable process of decay and decline. Um, take for example Treebeard's lament for the lost Entwives, or Aragorn's meditation as he passes the burial mounds of the kings of Rohan, and there's Theoden's despair for his kingdom. It all has in it something of the wider sadness at the inevitable passing of all earthly things, and, and that marks the poetry of the Anglo-Saxons. Edoras is the city of the Roarim, essentially a hill fort enclosing the great hall of Mediuseld and its outbuildings, which in the language of Rohan means the courts. Built into the foothills on the northern flanks of the White Mountains, Edoras commanded the approaches to Gondor through the gap of Rohan between the White Mountains to the south and the last of the Misty Mountains to the north. He leads them to Medjuseld, the hall of Theoden, king of Rohan. At the doors of Medjuseld, they are greeted with some suspicion by the guard. The country is on a war footing. Theoden addresses the wizard with cold contempt, seconded by Grima Wormtongue, who constantly advises caution and restraint. Gandalf exposes Wormtongue as a spy in the pay of Saruman, and Theoden is awakened. For all the, the vast military forces Sauron marshals against Gondor, his single most potent weapon 
is the despair he can induce among his enemies. The fate of Rohan hangs in the balance while Theoden sits immobilized by despair and he can take action only once he's thrown off the debilitating effects of his despair. At last he pulls himself together and announces that he will himself ride to the defense of his beleaguered western frontier to confront Saranan. Again you have to remember that in his young manhood he went through the Battle of the Somme. He went into the war, came out at the end of his four best friends, only one was alive at the end of it. And you know, various bits of this filter through, but you know, he, he was not somebody who was just completely gung-ho about war, as you can imagine. He was very, very conservative. Uh, Daily Telegraph reader, you know, had supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Very, very right-wing, very unattractive, therefore, to many modern readers of his books. Actually, this wasn't really fascism. He wasn't really deeply right-wing. He was merely somebody who had been born into a world where those were the accepted values, and, and he never uh, really rejected them. It's probably worth noting that Tolkien led most of his adult life as a married Oxford don who kept his home life with his wife and children very, very separate from his very full life that he led with his colleagues such as C.S. Lewis and others um, at, at the University of Oxford. Um, and it is not a world into which, at that time, women moved very easily for perhaps obvious reasons. And so the question of Tolkien's treatment of women in his books um, inevitably gets colored by that, I think. You don't see a lot of them, for starters. They're simply not present in the narrative to any great extent. And they represent very different aspects of Tolkien's consciousness of female characters. Theoden and Ioma lead the riders to the defense of Helm's Deep, an ancient stronghold on the northern flanks of the White Mountains of Gondor, now surrounded by Saruman's forces. It comprises an outwall defending the mouth of a deep and narrow ravine in the northern flanks of the White Mountains. A crenellated battlement further in forms the main line of defense. Behind it is a keep to serve as the defender's final refuge. Behind the keep, deep caves have been delved into the ravine's sheer slopes. They arrive just in time to confront the first overwhelming waves of Saruman's army in a ferocious night-long battle. As the sun rises, both sides are surprised by the spectacle of a great forest that appears to have sprung up in the rear of the attacker's lines overnight. These are the Hurons, semi-sentient trees with an implacable hatred of orcs. Treebeard has dispatched them to help the Roarim. Saruman's forces, caught between the charge of the Roarim and the Hurons, take to flight, and no orc escapes alive. One of the charges constantly leveled at the Lord of the Rings by its detractors is that its characters lack depth and development. But what such critics are often mistakenly reacting to is the fact that Tolkien does not use the same techniques most 20th century novelists use to signal their characters' psychology or development. To put it simply, Tolkien was not trying to write a 20th century novel. Deeply steeped in the literature of the Middle Ages, which he both analyzed as an academic and loved as a reader, Tolkien almost never allows us to intrude directly on the thoughts and inner deliberations of his characters. Instead, like many of the medieval authors he read and studied, he reveals character in action, in what his characters say and do, in the choices they are compelled by circumstance to make, and in their outward responses to the moral dilemmas they must confront. A good example of Tolkien's methods of characterization of work is the changing relationship between the dwarf, Gimli, and the elf, Legolas, who are sent with the fellowship when it sets out from Rivendell. The history of relations between elves and dwarves in Middle-earth as narrated in the Silmarillion, records a succession of misunderstandings, antagonisms and murderous hostilities which lie heavily on the psyches of Legolas and Gimli. 
The elf, though unfailingly polite and patient, does little to assuage the dwarf's prickly sense of grievances, both historical and personal. After all, Legolas's father, Thranduil, had once imprisoned Gimli's father, Gloin, in The Hobbit. The most powerful of the five wizards sent from the undying lands in the west to help the peoples of Middle-earth in their struggle against Sauron. Saruman has made a special study of Sauron's devices and been seduced into emulating them, seeking to coerce where he cannot persuade and using guile, deception and violence as elements of policy where it suits his purposes. And this is Saruman being tempted by the very idea of power. Saruman is somebody who decides to choose the dark force, like, who decides to go the way of evil. His fall offers him a further opportunity for redemptive change, but this he refuses. His character dramatizes the plight of a soul festering in its own evil, incapable of receiving freely offered grace, and the petty malice with which he exacts his tawdry revenge on the inhabitants of the Shire up to the moment of his murder by the aggrieved worm tongue is particularly effective. Gandalf leads a small party to Isengard for a parley with the defiant Saruman. During the negotiations, worm tongue hurls down a heavy missile from a high window, which misses Gandalf and rolls off unheeded to one side. Pippin rescues the large round crystal ball. That night, Pippin overwhelmed by curiosity, sneaks it away from the sleeping Gandalf. His sudden anguished cry wakes the camp. The ball is a palantir, one of a number of ancient seeing stones used in past ages to communicate over great distances. Through it, Pippin was confronted by the Dark Lord himself. The palantirs in The Lord of the Rings serve a couple of purposes. They're a piece of basically old technology, if you like. They are uh, relics of past ages when the great elf rites like Feanor and Celebrimbor, uh, who are mentioned in the Silmarillion, knew how to make things that could no longer be made in the Third Age. And so they have a kind of historical presence because of that, although that's only briefly mentioned by characters like Aragorn and Gandalf and uh, isn't leaned on very heavily in the story. What they really do is to move the action on. Gandalf announces that he must ride at once to Gondor, taking Pippin with him on Shadowfax. The others proceed to the muster of Rohan. Gandalf and the Hobbit ride east and south for several days along the northern flanks of the White Mountains to Minas Tirith, which they reach on March the 9th, while the others return to Edoras with the Rohirrim for their great muster on March the 7th. Frodo and Sam, of course, take a different path, parting from the rest of the Fellowship at their last resting place above the Falls of Raros on February the 26th. At the entrance to the ravine stand two enormous statues carved from the rock of the cliffs. The two figures stand facing north, one on either side of the river, with their left hands held out palm upward in warning and an axe in their right hands. The colossal crowned figures were carved in the likeness of Isildur and Anarion, the first kings of Gondor, to mark the kingdom's northern frontier. Frodo and Sam cross the great river and then proceed on foot across the rugged hills of the Emin Mule for 50 miles, heading northeast. There they are delayed for several days by the rough terrain, their own fatigue, and the need to deal with Gollum, who they met on February the 29th. Frodo begins in classic Hobbit territory, unaware of the great world without him, a bit bemused and puzzled when forces from the outside begin to affect him. And yet he very much rises to the occasion through that native Hobbit, Hobbit pluck. Um, he, both his courage and his humility serve him very, very well on the quest, and in fact are his salvation in the end. Sam, on the other hand, is, is from even further along the rustic end of the Hobbit spectrum. And although he never achieves quite the same broadening of his horizons that Frodo does, uh, his character too is greatly expanded by his experiences in his own more comic, country bumpkinish way. Gollum eventually leads them east out of the hills and into the dead marshes 
a maze of stagnant pools and treacherous paths thick with the stench of decay. Its waters cover part of the battlefield on which the last alliance of men and elves fought and defeated Sauron's forces many centuries before the events narrated in The Lord of the Rings. Strange lights flicker and play beneath the surface, illuminating the faces and forms of dead men, elves and orcs, all in states of horrible decay. Frodo compels Gollum to guide them into Mordor. He, he leads them because, you know, because he doesn't have a lot of choice and he is bound to the ring. He, you know, he cannot escape from the ring, you know, the, the fact that Frodo has got the ring. You know, that draws him. Gollum has a complexity that many readers feel is lacking in some of the other characters. He's, he's a character who is in a moral quandary. Um, given the circumstances of the narrative, he develops an attachment to Frodo that is very much in conflict with his deep hatred of the Bagginses who have stolen his precious, which he desperately wants to get back at all costs. And in the way of a good modern anti-hero, he's ultimately destroyed by his internal conflicts. Once through the marshes, Frodo and Sam approach the Morinon, the black gates of Mordor. So heavily guarded, they can see no way of entering. Gollum urges the hobbits to allow him to lead them into Mordor by a more secret way. And he leads them around the black gates into Ithilien, a wooded valley that follows the western slopes of the Mountains of Shadow. Frodo and Sam's brief stay in Athelion is the other major forest scene in the Two Towers. To the reader, the respite that Frodo and Sam enjoy as they take some rest and cook a meal comes as a, a pretty welcome relief after the images of decay and poisonous pollution that have dominated the Hobbit's passage of the Dead Marshes and the Dagger Lad. In the forests of Athelion, Frodo and Sam are captured by a party of warriors led by Faramir, brother of the late Boromir, who has been conducting a guerrilla campaign against Sauron's forces. After Frodo and Sam's arduous trek into the woods of Athelion following Gollum, their chance encounter with Faramir and his party offers unlooked for refreshment to both body and spirit that neither had expected to find between leaving the company and arriving at Mount Doom. So again, we see this pattern of unexpected help repeating itself. Faramir's soldiers also capture Gollum as he tries to catch fish in a hidden pool near Faramir's refuge. But Frodo pleads for Gollum to be spared and allowed to accompany him as before. Faramir grants Frodo's request and sends the travelers on their way. The two hobbits and Gollum then make their way eastward into the Morgul Vale as a great roof of cloud issues from Mordor, blotting out the sun and casting the whole land into a perpetual gloomy twilight by day. The secret pass Gollum wishes to use lies near Minas Morgul, a place of decay and lingering horror. They are forced to shelter when the King of the Ringwraiths leads the main body of the forces intended for the siege of Minas Tirith. The Ringwraith almost perceives Frodo in the ring, but, distracted by his more immediate mission, he presses on without discovering them. We have to keep reminding ourselves that the Lord of the Rings is not allegory. Uh, nonetheless, Tolkien wrote much of the book against the background of the Second World War. And as Frodo and Sam journey through the forbidding wasteland of the Emin Mool and the Dead Marshes, they labour against a, a constant undertow of despair and terror that's caused by the appearance in the skies of the flying ring wraiths. Tolkien had experienced combat in the trenches of the Great War and in his letters he left a very vivid passage describing his own thoughts as thousands of bombers flew over his house on the, their way to bring terror to Germany. So he had a, a personal experience of the fear and the menace that terror from the skies can engender. Well, I don't know because he was, Tolkien was much more influenced by the First World War than the Second. Um, when he was actually writing The Lord of the Rings during the Second World War, it's true that it was an unfolding as he wrote, but he was writing out of a, a great accumulation of ideas uh, that had been 
much more strongly influenced by the First World War in which he actually participated. Gollum then leads the hobbits up a steep and narrow mountain pass, partly natural, partly carved out in staircases, known as Sirith Ungol. At the top, he leads them into a long tunnel where he runs ahead, leaving the hobbits on their own. There they are attacked by a monstrous spider, Shelob whom Gollum has occasionally served by luring victims into her dwelling. This is Gollum's little plan to lead them that way because Shelob might get Frodo a bread when she's eaten him throughout the ring. He, he leads them away from the Black Gate. You know, he leads them down through Ithelion. But then he leads them up to, through Kirith Ungol in a way that would fulfill his own end. Frodo is stung and falls. Sam, driven by rage at his friend's injury, attacks Shelob in a fury and drives her off. Going back to Frodo, he finds him lying lifeless, and Sam is forced to choose between abandoning Frodo or the quest. Grief-stricken and uncertain, he takes the ring from Frodo's body and says farewell, intending to carry on to Mount Doom if he can. To his horror, he soon finds that Frodo isn't dead, just stunned by Shelob's sting. Sam determines to rescue Frodo from the party of orcs who are hurrying back with their prisoner, but the gate is closed and barred before Sam can reach it, leaving him utterly alone to ponder his next actions. Like his friends, Frodo, Merry and Pippin, the Hobbit, Sam Gamgee, faces perils and griefs in his adventures that have a profound effect on him. In his speech and attitudes, he is at the outset the least educated and most provincial or rustic of the Hobbits, something of a country bumpkin. He embodies the Hobbit tendency towards the parochial and the insular to the fullest degree possible. He also possesses the countryman's capacity for sizing up new situations shrewdly within his familiar terms of reference. Once he passes beyond the boundaries of the Shire, however, his judgments prove often comically premature and ill-informed. The Ring Bears, first of all, were all, all three hobbits, uh, Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam, because Sam did have the Ring for a while. And they responded to the Ring in somewhat different ways. Bilbo wasn't aware of the power of the ring. He didn't have to be. He just knew it could help him disappear. And then, of course, towards the end, through Gandalf, he became aware that it was actually affecting him more deeply and more strongly, that he found it very difficult to do without it. Um, so the addictive nature of the ring and the ring's power starts to become uh, apparent. Frodo obviously was the main ring bearer and he always had this terrible temptation to use this power which would have resulted in the defeat of everything he loved and everyone he loved and all that he held dear but he had to constantly if you remember that what happens in the book his, his hand always creeps up to, to to put on the ring involuntarily as it were because not just it would help him disappear, but also because it would give him this kind of power if he put the ring on. But of course, his power would be insignificant compared to Sauron's, so he would be immediately spotted and crushed. With Sam, of course, it, was, it became a very simple issue. I mean, Sam is a simple hobbit. Uh, it's sometimes infuriatingly simple. I mean, even Tolkien found Sam irritating. Uh, sometimes. Um, but Sam realized using this metaphor of a garden that what he, Sam, really needed or wanted was actually his own garden, not to rule all others in this enormous garden of which he was the king. And he was very clear that that wasn't his role, that wasn't his place. And once he realized that that's what the ring was offering him, as it were, then the temptation wasn't at all appealing to him, and he found it very easy not to use the ring. 
Yeah, Sam, I think, doesn't develop all that much, but he does develop. It's when you see his horizons being broadened. He learns a great deal from the many other characters he encounters. And the change in his character is starkly dramatized in his final encounter with Gollum on the slopes of Mount Doom, as we see Sam grow in strength to such an extent that he becomes a genuine hero. From The Hobbit's perspective in particular, the Two Towers carries on the Fellowship of the Rings pattern of opening out, as Frodo, Sam, Merry and Pippin, whose lives have previously taken them nowhere outside the Shire itself, encounter a bewildering variety of persons and powers in the wider world beyond. In the Fellowship of the Ring, these include the Ringwraiths and Orcs, Tom Bombadil, Rivendell and Lothlorien. While in the Two Towers they encounter Fanghorn and the Ents, the Roarin, Saruman, Gollum and Faramir, and witness some of the larger actions in the Wars of the Ring. The destruction of Isengard, the rearguard defense of Ithilien, the riding out of Sauron's hosts for the siege of Gondor. A large part of the sense of wonder, common to both books, derives from how Tolkien juxtaposes the Hobbit's narrow domestic perspectives against a far larger world of marvels and horrors whose existence they'd scarcely suspected. One of the recurring literary devices throughout The Lord of the Rings is the inexplicable appearance of help from unexpected quarters. As the company sets out from Rivendell in the Fellowship of the Ring, Elrond advises them that they may well find unlooked-for help along the way. And the Fellowship of the Ring and the Two Towers both repeat this thematic motif. The forests that figure prominently in both books serve as the settings for many such episodes. The help in the Lothlorien of the Ents from Fangorn comes as a surprise to all but Gandalf. Merry and Pippin's reception by Treebeard is certainly the last thing either of them could have expected after their ordeal among the Orcs. After Frodo and Sam's arduous trek into the woods of Ithilien following Gollum, their chance encounter with Faramir and his party offers unlooked for refreshment to both body and spirit that neither had expected to find between leaving the company and arriving at Mount Doom. It is difficult to talk about sources for Tolkien's narrative in the technical sense of the word. The story is almost wholly his own invention, though a number of literary and historical precedents have done a little to shape his handling of certain elements. C.S. Lewis famously said that Tolkien was about as easy to influence as a bandersnatch. Um, and, but if you look for it, you, you can see where he's coming from in a number of ways. The sort of thing that you get in, in the works that he academically was very much involved with. To mention Beowulf. In Beowulf, Hrothgar's hall has been reduced to a state of despair, which parallels Theoden in the Tale of Two Towers. The quest motif, uh, the chivalric bond that develops between Aragorn and Eomer, the gallantry of Faramir, and even Gimli's surprising devotion to Galadriel, all owe something to the, the Middle English romantic tradition. And that was another area of Tolkien's academic expertise. Beyond medieval influences, however, other possibilities appear far more tenuous. In their totalitarian aspirations, Sauron and Saruman bear a more than passing resemblance to Hitler and Mussolini. And the glimpses we get of the society of their orcs 
snarlingly echoes the brutal psychology of the fascist regimes over which those two dictators presided. Some have even suggested that the ring itself might symbolize the atomic bomb, a weapon of frightening power too potent to be used. Tolkien himself stoutly denied there were any allegorical intentions. He insisted that he'd conceived of the ring long before the advent of nuclear weapons. And he always pointed out that if it were an allegory, the ring would have been taken and used against Sauron. Now, as far as his conscious intentions went, he insisted that the story followed its own logic. And he himself often found himself marvelling at how history seemed to sometimes be shadowing his fiction. As a devout Catholic, Tolkien was far more likely to be influenced by the messianic strand in Jewish and Christian tradition when shaping Aragorn's part as a redeeming saviour figure. And we know from his letters that his depiction of Galadriel owes a little to the Marian devotions that were part of his own practice as a Catholic. Well, the first time you get elves coming on the scene in The Lord of the Rings, they are singing a hymn to Elbereth, who is a sort of almost Virgin Mary character. There's very little explicit, but when you, when you know, there was something again of a Christian ethos in this, because it is one of sacrifice. I think the only time you actually get any actual religious ceremony or anything is the standing silence, you know, when Faramir and his men, you know, a, you know, sort of the, the equivalent of grace before meals, where they turn to face the West. There is a, an idea of, of fate running through the Lord of the Rings. Gandalf discusses it sometimes by saying things like, perhaps it was meant to be that the ring came into your possession and not somebody else's. But it's not a kind of fate that does anything for you. Um, it's the kind of fate that if you are doing everything you can, it might then help you. And that's an idea of fate that comes from Northern mythology, which Tolkien obviously was very, very familiar with. And that's the kind of idea of destiny or fate that lies behind who ended up with the ring. In a way, it's more powerful than the ring itself, because the ring itself was obviously trying to get back to Sauron. This shadowy fate wants something else to happen, but it can't intervene directly. It totally depends on the characters doing everything they can, and then maybe it can act. He was deeply moved and grateful for the fact that so many people responded with great appreciation to the book. And although it was a heroic task. I think he greatly appreciated being able to reply to or to be in contact with so many people who wrote to him. The um, letters were enormous, but instead of the postman, a van used to arrive each morning with the morning's post, which he couldn't get through the door. And in the beginning, my father tried to answer them all. It used to come in at a phenomenal rate towards the end of his life. It still comes in. Uh, it ranged from the purely lunatic to the uh, highly informed critical analyses. Uh, he was also sent uh, curious presents, uh, mushrooms, which went bad in the post, and um, tobacco, and uh, uh, clay models of this or that, uh, which bamboozled him completely. He didn't know really what to make of it all. Uh, so, in the end, we took more and more of this onto ourselves on his behalf, and I think he was quite relieved. There were all kinds of, of horrors sprung on him in the years when the book was being successful, The Lord of the Rings. My favourite was the American Film Company, which turned up um, in Oxford wanting to film The Lord of the Rings, and it, they'd written the most wonderful storyline or scenario for it, um, in which all the kind of delicate things of the original story had been Hollywoodified. Um, Interestingly, a character who in, the, in Tolkien's story is called uh, Boromir was called by the American film writers Borimore, you know, shades of Ethel Barrymore. Um, the elves sustain themselves and, and fellow travellers on long journeys by 
uh, something called lembas or whey bread, which is a really rather kind of holy thing. It's a bit like communion wafers, actually, in, in the Christian church. It's got that kind of overtone. The Americans described this as a food concentrate. There were worse things to come uh, after his death. The Lord of the Rings has been filmed, uh, I think, fairly execrably by an American. And there was a horrible film of The Hobbit on American television and various other nasties like that. Fortunately, he didn't live to see those. They've, of course, twisted his own conception quite out of recognition. The thing's been Disneyfied or worse. Uh, there also, of course, been all kinds of toys and, and, and such like. It, most of that happened since, since his lifetime. There was nothing quite so awful in his lifetime. The last years were spent in trying to finish the Silmarillion, the big work of mythology, of which The Lord of the Rings is just a sequel. He went on and on at it. In fact, he never got anywhere near finishing. What he would do would not be simply to continue writing the story. He'd, in a sense, done all that years before. But he was always trying new versions of old bits or was trying to rewrite older versions of newer bits or something, by which I mean that, that it got terribly complicated textually. Actually, he never wanted to finish. This is quite clear. He never wanted to finish. I think he never wanted to publish it. It had been the necessary background to The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He didn't feel that seen close up to by readers, it would have the same excitement as it, as it certainly doesn't, despite very skillful editing by Christopher Tolkien. If Tolkien is a nostalgia monger, it's a very special and empowering and, I would say, precious kind of nostalgia that we could use a lot more of uh, in this world. And that's his legacy as I see it. The Two Towers is a text that can be approached on a number of levels. As a piece of pure narrative art, it is an accomplished performance, in which Tolkien marshals the increasingly divergent and complex threads of his story into a satisfying whole. It is also richly textured, a pastiche of Tolkien's wide learning and storytelling zest, in which he makes use of his linguistic and literary scholarship, as well as the earlier history and mythology of Middle-earth, which he'd been developing and expanding for decades, without either overwhelming the story in hand. Not a modern novel, then, by any standard, but something rich, strange, and for those susceptible to its charms, supremely successful. Thank <laughs> you.